Tomcat Apache dot org. Tomcat Apache dot org. I see that Tomcat is into it. It's into its uh, 7.0 version. I don't know if that version works or not. So I suggest that we stay in the Apache Tomcat 6 version. 6.0 version. You don't want to have to download the source code distributions, just download any of the binary distributions. Okay. Again, depending on your architecture, your laptop, you can download a 32 bit or a 64 bit. If you have been downloading MySQL 64 bit and Eclipse 64 bit and Java 64 bit, then make sure that you download Tomcat with the same 64 bit. You don't want a, them to be conflicting with each other for some reason. Um, in my case, I'll be downloading the 32 bit Apache Tomcat 6035. It's a zip. I don't want to have to install it. It's the same uh, thought process as the MySQL. I don't want it to be installed as a service. I just want it to run whenever I want it to. So, Tomcat, save. You extract it. I will extract it in my C drive. And it will create an Apache Tomcat 6035 folder. Apache Tomcat There it is. It's going to be our web server. If you guys remember previously from CSIS 3020, we were deploying everything to an Apache web server. An Apache web server that had an adapter to PHP. So when it found something that ended in that PHP on the URL, it will know to redirect to the PHP interpreter. In this case, Apache Tomcat is also a web server, but it also includes what it's called a Java a servlet container. Java servlet container. And basically is an interpreter that knows what to do with server-side scripting in Java. So you're going to see pages, typically Java server pages, that end in JSP. You will see JSPs that contain Java code. Uh, that will get translated into servlets. Servlets is a specific type of Java class. And you can also have functionality in plain servlets. You don't have to have it in J JSPs all the time. You can also have it in Java servlets classes that basically will run on the server and it will they will generate HTML code. 
Okay. So that's why we're going to need Tomcat to deploy our project. Okay, I also took the author source code from Blackboard, downloaded it, unzipped it into the Rapid Java, and this is where where's my rapid java I don't know where I put it yeah that's where I typically put them all so save I thought I had a rapid java somewhere in here Okay. So I'm going to save it. And when you extract it, it will create that rapid Java folder, like I said, which is, you know, it should be your workspace. I mean, you don't want to you want to, you don't want it to be your workspace up to you. But when you look at it, this is what you will find. You will find four folders: Timex, Timex2, Spring Hibernate, and Library. We're going to be working most of the time out of Timex, which is the first version of the Timex um, online timesheet system web application. That's what it's called. The project is called Timex, even though the project is called online timesheet system. And we're going to be using library. If you guys look at library, It's basically a whole bunch of jars. JARS stands for Java Archive. If you change that file into a .zip and open it with WinZip or whatever, you will see that it's just basically a compressed bunch of files and folders. In fact, this jar contains, typically contains, compiled Java classes. Source code that was compiled into their bytecode. And then it gets packaged, compressed, like a zip file. But it just has the extension jar. If any of those classes inside the jar contains the main method, that's where it will start executing. So you can actually create a jar of Java classes that will run from the jar itself. It will look for that class that has the common well-known point of entry called the main and we're gonna s we're gonna get to do something like that in Eclipse in a few in a few minutes. But these jars these jars are the ones that we're gonna need to be able to create a web application using Hibernate and Spring. So the author gave us his version, and this is going back to 2000. The book is from 2006, 2005, 2006. So these are jars from Spring and Hibernate from back then. It was probably, I don't know, Spring 1.1 <laughs> and um, Hibernate 3. Very old versions, but we can still use them. Okay. So that, those are libraries. And then Timex, Timex is the one that contains the actual source code, at least some of it. So once I extract this um, zip file of the source code into Rapid Java, then I import it into into Eclipse. And this is it. This is Timex. That's what I call it, yeah.
Timex web with index.jsp. I'm about to import it, so I'll let you know if that's the, the version or not. But this is how you import it. You, you download this zip, unzip it into your Rapid Java workspace. It will create a folder called Timex underscore web. And then you go into Eclipse, right click on the, pa on the package explorer, you right click and say import. Existing project into workspace. Under the general section you will click on existing projects into workspace. And then you tell it what's the root directory, which obviously is Rapid Java. And then it will show you all the different projects that you can import. There's so many of them in, in my workspace that I just deselect them all. And then I'm just going to select Timex Web, the guy that I just downloaded. Finish. And here it is. Timex Web basically has nothing. It has nothing. What does it have? Timex Web has source and nothing is under source, so there's no Java classes. Under web content, which is where you're supposed to put all the Java server pages, all the HTML, all the cascading style sheets, all the images, etc., etc., it only has one file called index.jsp. Now, since this is a web application, it has to have, under web content, it has to have a web inf, and under the web inf, it will have a web XML. This is what it's called the web descriptor, the deployment descriptor, I'm sorry. This web XML will tell Tomcat how to deploy your project. So Tomcat will read this web XML and determine how to deploy and run your project. That will be created automatically for you when you create a brand new web application in Eclipse. That's the good thing about the the um, Um, the interface with Eclipse, the uh, what is it called? The wizards, the wizard that that Eclipse contains. When you create a new project, aha, uh -huh. that's what we're missing. We're missing the web. Toolkit. That's something that we gotta download in order to create a a, a, um, a web application in this version of of Eclipse. Notice that we can only create a general project, a project from CVS, a plain Java project, which is typically the one that gets packaged into a jar, and then a plugin. That's all we can do with this version of Java. So we're going to have to download the web toolkit. So go to help, check for updates, let's see if we have a web toolkit plugin. No updates were found, okay. So we're going to install new software. from the Indigo website. see 
application development frameworks, business intelligence, collaboration, database, general purpose, Linux, mobile and device, modeling, programming languages. Nope. You won't find it under the Indigo downloads either. I think that's why it was much a much better idea to download the J the uh, Clips Java EE version. That one probably has the Web Toolkit installed already. Okay, so let's take a look at the available software sites. So when you go in, you, still in the install, there's like this. Find more software by working with the available software sites preferences. You will see that there's a whole bunch of other websites that you can go to for downloads. So right now we only have two in use, which is the download Eclipse for the Indigo and the updates for 3.7. But there's one in here called... Tools. Wonder what that is. Usually it's called the WT Web Toolkit, WTK, or something like that. And I do not see it. So we're going to have to Google it. World Toolkit Eclipse. Web Tools Platform, it's called. the software repository site. An alternative to downloading zips from the build pages, our latest re release builds can be installed from our software repository site. So, and that's for the Helios though. Let's download it. Yeah, I think what we did is we downloaded the Eclipse Classic, right? 371. So if we take a look at the details of the Classic, notice that it says there's no features list whatsoever included. But if you go into the Java EE developers, look at all the different features that are added in the EE version. The data tools, which we can download, that's no big deal. JST, we're going to need those. Miling, we don't really need. And then the web toolkit. The web toolkit. I don't know. We'll try downloading it. If it doesn't work, then we're just going to go and switch to the Eclipse JEE -E version. So let's add a software site. This software site, I'm going to call it the Web Toolkit. And I'm just going to paste that Downloads eclipse.org web tools repository helios click ok click ok and then 
we're going to select that one. See what we get. All the web tools platforms. Let's stick with the latest version, which is 325. 325. Web Tools Platform 325 and Web Tools Platform SDK 325. Next. It's going to tell me that it's going to download all this stuff. See the JST, the WST, all that stuff that we looked at in the J in the EE version. Next, then you accept the terms of the licenses. Yeah, blah blah blah. And then it's going to install the software. Anyway, we were doing this because we could not create a brand new web application in this version of Eclipse. But when you do, when you create a brand new web application, Java web app, Eclipse, it will create a project pretty much the same structure. The web content with a web in folder in it with a web XML inside it. That's in the background while I explain this. So Basically, this project contains only one page. Oh, and then there's a library under the webinf. Under the library, you will put every jar that your project relies on. So if you look, let's take a look at it. Eh, doesn't look nice. It looks ugly. Why? Because we haven't installed the... We haven't installed the web toolkit. All right. But basically, this is what a JSP looks like. You guys can look at this. Let me change the press here, and you guys can see it much bigger. The text font I'm going to put it 14. Is that better? This is what a JSP looks like. For those of you that have seen CSIS 3020, you immediately identify these. It's HTML. Paragraph, a div, center, that's not used anymore. And then also you will see, once in a while, you will see the less than percent. Script tag! Comes a little bit of scripting, server side scripting. And if you look at server side scripting, you look at this syntax, it is job. Hence, it's called. Java server page, JSP short. If we were be looking at PHP, then you will be looking at the HP code around HTML. Or if we were looking at an ASP, active server pages, then you will be looking at C sharp or VB server side code. What does this JSP seem to be doing? Somehow it's creating a driver. It's it's a constant, right? Final string driver. And it's creating a new instance of that class out of here. So obviously we're going to need a com.mysql.jdbc.driver class. 
and since we don't have that in our source because our source is empty then most probably it's coming out of the library the jar library and indeed it is if you guys take a look at the jar that it's included in the project you will see that that jar contains a whole bunch of packages and one of those packages contains the driver class and this thing is rebooting hopefully we'll be, we're going to be able to see the JSP much better now oh, why let's try it again open with the JSP editor yeah isn't this much nicer now it's color coded and you can see where is the Java code that's basically the only difference with the ecl classic Eclipse and the Eclipse EE you know it has a whole bunch of editors and wizards and know a little bit more. Okay, so here it is. Connection, result set, statement, these are all classes that must come from some, here it is, import from the Java SQL star import. So let's take a look at uh, a little bit inside the library there's a MySQL connector Java so this is the one that's going to allow us to connect to a Java I mean to a MySQL database and it probably contains all those Java classes <coughs> let me see if I can look at inside this jar I'm going to switch to a, another view called the Project Explorer view and when you do that when you do that you will be able to see under the Java resources libraries web app libraries and then you can actually go inside the jar and take a look at the different packages see that so here it is the jar that we're including in our project this jar contains a com mysql jdbc if you expand that package you will see that there's a driver class that's the one that we're using here that we're creating a new instance of. Okay? Driver. In fact, we're also using connection. So somewhere in here has got to be a connection. Here it is, connection. And we're also going to use a result set. So somewhere in here is a result set. So you get my point. Apparently, we're building a Java server page that contains Java server-side code that will allow us to connect. That will allow us to connect to a MySQL database and print. Notice that we have a table construction here: TRs and TDs, and print the contents of that data in the database into an HTML page. Here it is, JDBC, here's this string URL that would allow us to connect to the database. JDBC MySQL, localhost, 3306, all that stuff. Okay? So we have to have a MySQL database on the localhost, listening through port 3306 for a Timex database. Okay, 
with user root and no password. And we're going to use that URL so we can connect to our database and create this connection. That's through the driver manager. So the driver manager must be another class, static class, that allows us to connect to the database. So this is all using existing um, Java classes. Then we're going to create a statement with that connection. And the statement is going to execute a query. And the query is going to be select star from department. And then we're going to loop through the result set. It's going to it's going to return a result set. Execute query will return a result set. And then we're going to loop through the result set. And then we're going to do this module ca calculation that will determine whether we're going to do it with this background color or this background color. Each one of the table data. And we're going to be creating a table with three table data. The counter and whatever it's coming up from the first field and whatever is coming up on the second field. Then we're going to close the result set, we're going to close our statement, and we're going to close our connection. Good idea. If anything goes wrong, if something uh, goes wrong with the execution, then we're just going to catch that exception and print out the exception on the page. I mean, not in the page, in the system that out. And that's it. Okay. So that's our first version of a web application in Java. Now we're going to, we're going to need this SQL statement, I mean this SQL file to construct our database. And you're going to do the same thing when you submit your project. At whatever stage you submit your project, you're going to have to include inside the project a SQL file which is a backup of your database. That is so I can recreate your database and run your project. So let's do that. Let's copy this, the contents of this SQL file which is, seems to be like the backup of the Timex database. And let's open one of the GUI tools like Query Browser, connect to the database. I do not have a Timex. Okay. So we're going to create a Timex. Opening a new script tab, I paste the contents of that SQL file and then I run it. And here it is. Now I have a Timex. A Timex with a department table. Look at this. A department table contains only two fields. Very simple stuff. A department code and a department name. Then there's this other one called the employee table. And the employee table contains an employee ID, employee name, employee email, employee code, which seems to be like the type of employee or the role of the employee, then a password in clear text, which is not a good idea, um, manager of the employee, oh, the manager employee ID, so who does this employee report to? Okay. So pretty much it's just a table of all the employees. And finally, the timesheet. The timesheet table. 
Oops. What happened? Here it is. The timesheet table contains a timesheet ID and employee ID, which is the ID of the employee that that timesheet belongs to. Right? So right there we are implementing our one-to-many relationship between employee and timesheets. Then there's the status code. Remember the status code that I talked to you about in the finest day machine? PA, approved, disapproved, and all that. This is it. Status code. Period ending date. So every timesheet has a period ending date. Typically ends on a Sunday or ends on a yeah, ends on a Sunday, I think. Then the department code that this timesheet is charged to. So this is another uh, relationship with the department table through the department code. One too many relationship. Then the minutes worked on Monday, minutes work on Tuesday, etc. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So we're going to save the amount of time worked in minutes. We're going to save it in minutes. And that's it. That makes up my, uh, our database for this project. Three tables. You guys are going to have to create your own database for your own project. Probably on the third or fourth week. Okay? After you have a better idea what you're building. Is it going to be um, written in stone? Probably not. You probably will realize later on that you're going to need more tables or less tables and more fields or less fields or change the name of the fields. doesn't matter. As long as you keep creating backups of your database and include them in your project, then I will always have the latest version of your database that will work with your web application. Okay, so what now? So the only thing that it's left to do is to execute this project. So we're going to refresh the project. We're going to clean it. Timex Web. And then we're going to deploy it. Right there, I see a problem. Do you guys remember what's the Apache Tomcat that we um, downloaded? Six, right? Tomcat 6. Well, first of all, we haven't notified Eclipse about it. So we have to tell Eclipse, hey, there is an Apache 6 out there that we want to use. How do we do that? We go into the Windows Preferences. We go into the Server section. And we go into the Runtime Environments. So Window, Preferences, Server, Section, runtime environments and we're just going to add that Apache Tomcat 6.0 by the way the web toolkit plugin that we downloaded knows about Apaches about a basic HTTP server it knows about Westphere which is the IBM version of the Tomcat it knows about JBoss open source Object Web and Oracle, the Oracle OC4J. But we're not going to use any one of those. We're just going to use the Apache Tomcat 6.0. So 
Next. Then you're going to tell it where you installed it. The Tomcat installation directory. So you browse and take take it to where you install it. Right there. Apache Tomcat 6035. And we're going to use the workbench default JRE. Click on finish. And now we have a Tomcat Apache Tomcat server linked to our Eclipse where we can deploy our projects. One more thing that we need to do here in Eclipse, we have to tell it that we have a JDK, not a JRE, but a JDK. So we go into Windows Preferences again, and under Java section, under Install JREs, you go ahead and indicate in here that you need that you have a JDK. I already did that apparently, or already detected that one, and that will be the JDK use. Uh, that will be the JRE used by default. Okay, so that's it. Okay, so now we have to correct that thing that says the server library is in Apache Tomcat 5.5. So let's modify that under the Timex Web. The Timex Web has a build path. And the build path tells it where are all the libraries that it relies on and and where it should find them, etc., etc. So you can go and configure the build path. Notice that when you configure the build build the build path build path, you can go into libraries and you will see that there's a, a red mark under the JRE system library JDK which doesn't exist. So you're gonna have to remove it. We have a JDK 16027, not 06, which is apparently the one that was being used when this project was created. So we're going to remove it. And the server library Apache 5.5, remove it as well. Then we're going to add a library, the JRE system library. It's the workspace JRE default. Here it is. So now we change it from JDK 1606 to JDK 16027, which is the one that we're using. And we're also going to add the library for the server runtime. That is the Apache Tomcat. Now we have the correct JDK. We have the correct Apache. We still have our web app libraries. Everything looks good. We do not rely on other projects. And the source is still Timex Web SRC. The compiled versions of those source files will go under Timex Web build classes. Those are typical um, installations or type um, hierarchies of a, a regular web application. You click OK, and now we can clean up the project, so we go into Project, Clean. We still have problems, apparently, on our JSP, and I'm not sure what they are. So, remember, Eclipse has a section called Problems, where you can look at what errors you have. And so it says that this class cannot be resolved. And that the connection cannot be resolved to a type. Okay. Oh, I think we're missing the ear libraries. Okay. Can that connection cannot be resolved to a type. It's a JSP problem. Yeah, it's because probably because we're missing the year libraries that know how to import stuff into the JSP. Um, let's take a look at the 
build path once again. And under the libraries, let's remove that ear library and then let's add the ear libraries. Okay. Under the manifest class path entries, so we probably have the wrong manifest. Let's take a look at the manifest. Doesn't have a class path, so Okay, that's weird. All I had to do was modify the import statement and save it and everything looks good now. Now it knows what the connection is and the result set. Let me make sure that I clean it. I'm going to clean it again. And there's only one problem here, that is the target runtime Apache 5.5 is not defined. Correct. So we're going to have to modify that. We're going to have to tell, hey, Eclipse, this project will be deployed to a Tomcat 6, not a Tomcat 5.5. How do we do that? We go into the Timex Web Properties. And somewhere in here, it says where it's going to be deployed. Targeted runtimes. Here it is. Notice that under targeted runtimes, it indicates that it's going to go up, that it's going to be deployed to an Apache Tomcat 5.5. So we uncheck that and we just check the Apache Tomcat 6.0, apply, OK, and we no longer have any problems. So now we have a compiled project. It's a Java web application with Java server-side scripting in a Java server page, connecting to a MySQL database, and we're about to deploy it and execute it in Tomcat. So we just right-click on it. We're going to say run as on the server. It's going to be this server, localhost, pretty much keep everything by default. Finish. The first time that that you do this, it will tell Windows will try to block it. So make sure that you allow it and you say unblock. Oop. Port 88 required for Tomcat server. Look, it's already used. You are right, sir. I have Apache behind the scenes running, listening through port 8080. Bad idea. So I'm going to stop my Apache server, which is hugging, hugging up my 8080. And then I'm going to try it again. Run S on the server. Finish. So notice, OK, I'm block it. Here it is. Notice that the console show show up showed up a few things that happened behind the scenes. The console the console on Eclipse will print out everything that goes to the system that out. Okay? And in fact it will also um put in the console a few of the um logging a few of the things that get logged when you launch the Tomcat server. So notice what happens. In here, we're looking at the Tomcat, the local host Tomcat, the Apache Tomcat. And it loaded Catalina, it loaded Tomcat, it's listening. Uh, initializing Coyote, which is, is one of the components of the Tomcat, 
and it's listening on port 8080. Okay, it's initializing it. Uh, blah blah blah. And then at the end, it says the server started up in 756 microseconds, and I'm ready and listening through port 8080 for any requests. And then since we're executing the web project, it launches the internal Eclipse um, browser with that URL, localhost 8080 Timex Web. Notice that we didn't have to indicate that we wanted the index.jsp because that's the um, the document that we'll look for by default under a Tomcat server, an index.jsp. If you name your JSP something different, then you will have to indicate it in here in the URL. And this is it. As you can notice from what we're looking at, this is the web page that contains the records from the department table. Okay? Now, one last thing. You can actually copy this URL into any browser, external browser, and you should get the same results. Okay? In fact, you can even do it in Firefox and with a plugin called Firebog, you can actually take a look at the HTML generated. As you can see by the HTML generated, there's no indication that this page was rendered by a Java code executing on the server side.